August winds did come and blow as we bundled up for the yearly show down Bowen Hills Way with a radio to play the golden hits we'd all come to know. News flash people, it's getting to the end of the 60s, there are Beatles about, and somewhere off in the distance, someone's mama cries. Grab hold of something fast, because here come the hits of August 20, 1969. At 10, it's that Bonzer Aussie bloke Johnny Farnham with his rendition of One, that which is the loneliest number. Another in his string of early career smashes, Farnsey nails it with a muscular precision, and it's one of his best remembered pre I'm John now, by the way, hits. According to Kent, this is the second biggest hit of the year. I don't know how he got that. By me, it spent four non consecutive weeks in the 10 for a top of 10. Well, who do you believe? The professional who spent over 50 years compiling charts with a guy with the weird off brand micro channel? Your choice. Numero 90 is Canada's Andy Kim with his version of the Ronettes' Baby I Love You. Kim had a couple of handy hits and probably could have had more. He had a strong, warm voice, could handle a pop hook smoothly. He had teeny bopper idle good looks and he was a handy songwriter. More on this lately. This was a pretty good hit, six weeks in the 10 for a top of three. The interesting thing about the chart this week is while it's unchanged from last week, no fewer than five songs are spending their last week in the 10. Numbers 10, 8, 7, 6 and 4 would all be gone next week. Number eight is Doug Parkinson's much loved and stately cover of Dear Prudence, a song recorded by the actual Beatles themselves, don't you know? Interestingly, the White Album was still at number one at the start of this month. There were only three number one albums for the whole of 1969. The White Album, which started the year spending most of its 16 weeks at number one. The current incumbent, which we will later see spent 28 weeks at number one. And then Abbey Road took over for the rest of the year. So this song was very fresh in the public mind and Parkinson and his band do a great job. Very faithful to the original arrangement, but Parkinson's strong and slightly stagey voice gives it a much more assertive and confident tone than Lennon's weedy white album warblings. A real Aussie classic. Seven is more Aussie mayhem with the Valentines and their fantastic My Old Man's a Groovy Old Man, written and produced by Harry Vander and George Young. The Valentines were an interesting group from Adelaide. They had two lead singers, Vince Cosgrove, who went on to be the doyen of Australian music journalists and manager of one of our greatest ever groups, The Divinals, and a guy called Bon Scott, who went on to fame, fortune and ignominious death in a Renault 5. This is a terrific song, so much fun, I'm amazed it wasn't a bigger hit. Of course, the connection between Bon Scott and Vander and Young would become handy a little later on. Six is Time Is Tight by the most excellently groovy Booker T and the MGs, a song that, even if you don't know what it's called, you know it. I got to meet Booker T once, shake his hand and got his autograph on his set list. He seemed bewildered as to how I came to be in possession of it. And a year later I stood in front of the stage, slack-jawed and obutescent, as Steve Cropper, guitarist on this, and the guy who made me want to play guitar in the first place, reeled off his licks. So Booker T and the MGs are just alright with me. It's time to jive with number five, and it's the most interesting and probably the most famous record on the charts this week. Sugar Sugar by the Archies, one of the most culturally ubiquitous records in the entire classic canon. The biggest selling record in the world in 1969, eight weeks at number one in the UK, four weeks in the US, and that doesn't count the copies that were given away free in boxes of Super Sugar Snack, 55% sugar, breakfast cereal. And it's one of the biggest sellers ever. It is an indisputable pop masterpiece. The Archies actually had four top 40 singles, including two million sellers, and their last US chart entry was in 1972. They've also made occasional live appearances, especially on the Jerry Lewis telethon. Ron Dante and Tony Wine were the staple of vocalists in the band. There's only one song they ever cut that uh, Dante or Wine didn't sing lead on. And this song features co-writer Andy Kim, that guy again, on backing vocals with Ray, Everything is Beautiful, Stevens on hand claps. The irresistible bass line is played by Hollywood studio great Joe Mack and the sock and ball guitar part is Philadelphia legend Dave Appel, who later oversaw Tony Orlando and Dawn's huge hits in the early 70s. Thing of it is, for all its mega success worldwide, it was only to manage a single week at the top, knocked off by the Rolling Stones with Honky Tonk Women. 
and now it's time for the segment which neither shot the sheriff nor the deputy because it respects the rule of law and order and salutes the job that our wonderful police officers do. Hello and goodbye! Where we check out the songs which have arrived in the top 10 this week and salute those which have left and there has only been one arrival and departure this week. Sugar Sugar by the Archies, which was up from 14 to 5. It spent nine weeks in the top 10 for a peak of numero uno for a single week. It replaces She's My Baby by that man John Blanchfield. Local Brisbane boy, we mentioned him in TRB62, was it? John, I've sent your friend requests on Facebook and everything. Do get in touch. I'd love you to be on the show. So She's My Baby spent four weeks in the top 10, peaked at number four, and another outstanding success for local talent. The next number one record is at number five this week, that's right, it's Sugar Sugar by the Archies, which goes to the top on the 3rd of September. So, with that, we'll move on to the trade-up, where we look for songs outside of the top 10. It's a little difficult this week, because there's a lot of ex-top 10 records on the chart this week, and there's only one that I could see that was good enough to stand with them, and that's the Jim Webb song, Where's the Playground, Susie, performed almost inevitably by Glenn Campbell. Now, it's no Wichita lineman, but then very few other songs are, but it has Webb's fingerprints all over it, the intricate but gentle melody, the drama and release. The only problem is the lyrics. First verse is fine, but the second verse is classic textbook gaslighting and coercive control. And also, I don't think that it's his right, as he says at the end, to decide whether she goes and plays around. That's her choice and her consequences to accept. The album this is from, Galveston, by the way, is an absolute banger. Now, where were we? Seven. Number seven is... No, wait, we don't do seven after the trade-up. Cards are back in the box, you goblin. It's four. Four, and it is the veritable Beatles themselves with the ballad of John and Yoko, one of whom was an actual Beatle in person. A huge mega hit. This debuted at the start of July at number two, knocking hair off the top spot, and next week sitting imperiously atop the charts for a month. It's enjoyable and all, it's just John and Paul, but it's a long way from the best Beatles single. But it just goes to show the Beatles could put out any old piece of rubbish and we'd buy it. That remains the case to this day. Number three, and we have Spinning Wheel by Blood, Sweat and Tears. A lot of people think this was like their other big hit, And When I Die, written by the mighty Laura Nero, but that isn't so. Sound as it might, like one of her songs, it actually came out before And When I Die. It's a cool song, and for whatever blanditudes the band was to descend to, David Clayton Thomas was an excellent and strong singer, and this made for a hit that sounded great, but never really got its due on the charts. Five of its 12 weeks in the 10, and for a top here of three. Ah, oh, well, better luck next time, kids. One of the earliest songs I can ever remember on the radio, I also remember my mother liked this and would sing along when it came on. In the penultimate position, it is the Droningly Boring in the year 2525 by the Droningly Boringly named Zager and Evans. How this got released as a single, I'll never know, but here it is, number two. It stayed in the top 10 for eight weeks, and at 15 weeks, it was the joint longest charting record this week, along with Time Is Tight and this week's number one. I have no idea what it means and will happily take advice from the audience here. Here are some more amazing facts. There are no seagulls in Hawaii. The day after tomorrow is called Overmorrow, and in Turkey, a turkey is called an American bird. Here are some slightly less amazing facts. It's Val's fantastic world of fact. Top Movalator and Groovalator this week is Listen to the Band by the Monkees. 15 places to number 17, bound for number 3. It's Noble Heartbroken by the unlockable combination of Sugar Sugar and Honky Tonk Women. While the Monkees made one last rush up the charts, Herman's Hermits made their last drop down with my sentimental friend dropping 9 places to 24 after a peak of 4. Highest debutante this week is Johnny Cash, with one of his most famous, if less essential, hits, A Boy Named Sue. Now, Johnny Cash was my mother's favourite singer, so I remember this being played at every party across most of my childhood. It would get to number four. And the longest running record on the charts this week is Hair by the Cowsills, from the celebrated hippie musical of the same name, holding on for the 16th of its eventual 17 weeks. 
it had perhaps the unique spot of knocking the verified Beatles themselves off the top spot in dispatching Get Back, only to lose it again to our Liverpudlian overlords on the rebound when the Ballad of John Yoko stormed up the charts. In the USA this week, the charts were topped for the last of its six weeks by the droningly boring in the year 2525 by Zager and Evans, and in the UK the Rolling Stones flew the flag proudly with their lascivious honky-tonk women. This time last year, the chart topper was the Orange and the Green by the Irish Rovers, and I have to say I'm not looking forward to doing that top 10. It's bloody awful. That might be a job for AI. Next year, with the radio band in full effect, our local version of Mungo Jerry's In the Summertime by The Mixtures was in the midst of a seven-week run at the top. And the number one album in town this week was the original cast recording of Hair. As mentioned before, in the middle of a 28-week run at the top, only nine albums have ever spent as much as 25 weeks on top in Australia. Whispering Jack by John Farnham. When he makes his comeback, this will go through the roof. Oddly, I've never owned a copy. Divide by Ed Sheeran, which I've also never owned, but I'm not surprised by that. With 27. Hair with 28. Local girl Delta Goodrum's Innocent Eyes with 29, which matches the mighty hot August night by Neil Diamond, also with 29. You can guess which one of those two albums I don't own. Sgt Peppers by The Beatles Mark II, which has 30. 21 by the lovely Adele with 32. Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits with a frankly mystifying 34. And of course the all-time champ, The Sound of Music with 76. Hello, it's me, your good friend and neighbour, Old Fowley. Now, what we just saw with that hair album is an album with an iconic and evocative uh, art package. The cover photo design really displays the freaky, do what you want to do vibes of the mind expanding late 60s. Not every album was so lucky in terms of the design choices made when they presented it. And here are a dozen, they're by, by a long way not the worst album covers ever, they're just really bad, um, which the artist may have regretted their design decisions after they put them out. George Jones, I Want to Sing from 1977. There is no singer I listen to as much these days as George Jones, but jeez. Look at this horror. You can tell by the eyes, which have been set to a normal distance apart, not like Jones' usual beady look. George had recently taken a liking to cocaine. Creed, Weathered from 2001. This album made number one, despite the handicap of a cover being designed by a nine-year-old having his first go on Photoshop. Donny Iris, Back on the Streets from 1980. This is actually a pretty good record in a jerky new wave style, but the cover is several degrees of off especially the Stratocaster with the Telecaster neck. Pantera, Metal Magic from 1981. Dimebag Darrell was a great guitar player and a legendarily nice guy. Gene Simmons donated his personal kiss coffin for Dime to be buried in. Paul from Rainbow Skull Party told me that. He deserves better than this as part of his legacy. Oh my god. Prince, self-titled from 1979. I like this album a little bit more every time I hear it but the fair moustache is a real impediment to taking the record out to play it. Unlike the Love Sexy cover, there is no irony whatsoever in this. Sufjan Stevens and Angelo de Augustine, A Beginner's Mind from 2021. I bet that this is the best record here, I quite like it. But what did I say about kids and Photoshop? Quintron and Miss Pussycat, Goblin Alert from 2020. If you like to be 52, you might like this one, maybe. I don't love it, but the more I hear it, the more I do like it. They're from New Orleans. Miss Pussycat's day job is as a puppeteer. Just sounds like kids messing about in the garage. They obviously got a classmate to do the album art. I got no idea with this one. We got Muddy Waters, some Confederates, heavy metal shenanigans, and a kind of sexy 40s nightclub thingy. I told you Eastern Europe was a gold mine. Harold Blanchard, command performance from God knows when. Yeah, Harold playing for his fan club of three people. Bobby Vogel, Stuffed Crust Jesus, again from God knows when. Yeah, give me a large pepperoni with extra cheeses. Uh, and the worst of the worst, Adele Valentine, his piano and orchestra from sometime in the late 50s, where they play possibly the songs of Kurt Cobain. Oh no, he went there. there. 
Well, here we go again with this week's number one. It's the cool cat from the Congo who goes mental on the bongos. Monty the Safety Monkey. And at number one this week, it's Elvis Presley with his last number one hit, written in honour of his favourite chocolatey dessert in the ghetto. Are you sure that's right? In the ghetto. I'm a fitness star for it. I can get a fact checking on fire. Recorded at the same time as his mega comeback album from Elvis in Memphis and written by none other than future number one hit maker, I think certainly, oh, I think certainly top five, Mac, oh lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way, Davis, you can't all be Andy Kim, you know. Elvis reigned upon the throne of the charts for four weeks before being disposed of by Sugar Sugar. Look, it's a great record. Elvis's vocal stays way clear of the sentimentality or sanctimony that the song might invoke, and it has that familiar velvet rumble underpinning it. The Colonel hated it, which just makes it even cooler. A great way for the King to sign off from his number one hit making spree. Well, that's how the cow ate the cabbage this week, and should the good Lord be a willing and the creeks don't arise, we'll be back with another episode next week. -ish. <laughs>